Minister, who is ultimately responsible for leading DFO? That would be me. And I'm hoping, and we're encouraging you to come out very soon with an announcement to correct things. Are you aware that DFO unilaterally diluted the conclusions. Having the DFO responsible for aquaculture runs in direct conflict to their obligation to employ the precautionary principle. Your department manipulated the science. And- if you pour $647 million into a system that isn't working. You use it a lot. You use word salads a lot, Minister. Wild Pacific salmon are in dire straits in some areas. We know. We need- What's your end goal, I guess? My end goal is to make sure that we have wild Pacific salmon. That is my end goal. In an occurrence as rare as the Fraser River sockeye salmon opening, on June 2nd, the Fisheries Minister for Canada attended a federally run State of the Pacific Salmon Session, answering questions by the Standing Committee on Fisheries and Oceans on the extremely dire state of the Pacific salmon. Fisheries Minister the Honourable Bernadette Jordan appeared before this committee just days before her major June 8th announcement that the federal government will be launching a $647 million Pacific Salmon Strategy. This will be the largest investment in salmon by any government in history. In this part three of our State of the Pacific Salmon series, we have compiled shortened clips from the intense two-hour session pertaining just to the dire state of wild Pacific salmon. If you have not watched part one or part two of our State of the Pacific Salmon series, we encourage you to watch it as it showcases the highest level of competency on saving and managing wild Pacific salmon. We will provide links to all the videos below. We hope you enjoy this presentation and encourage all industry members to go to the Fisheries Minister Bernadette Jordan's Facebook and Twitter page to let her know your concerns. To Mr. Jans for six minutes or less, please. Mr. The PRV paper published on May 26th shines an unfavorable light once again on the Department of Fisheries and Oceans refusal to heed the science on the risk of salmon farming on wild salmon. When science reporting risk from salmon farming is published, invariably the department and industry downplay it. However, it seems implausible that scientists at UBC, University of Toronto, SFU, the Pacific Salmon Foundation, for example, can be wrong every time. How will you evaluate the implications that a virus has been reported accidentally, imported, sorry, accidentally by the Atlantic uh, salmon farming industry and is spreading with serious health impacts on some species of wild salmon. Who will you turn to? And will you be designing PRV, designating PRV as a disease agent so that it is captured under fisheries regulations? Uh, Thank you for the question. And I know that a number of people have uh, reached out to me directly with regards to PRV and the concerns that they've seen. I will say that uh, we welcome any new research that can help us identify and understand the potential risks of the, of the PRV virus um, and, astro- and associated strains. Um, we do continue to support the research and the, and the number of factors that, include, that impact the health of our wild salmon. Um, and I guess, you know, I mean, I could, in, in saying that, uh, we will absolutely take into, we, we, all of our science is peer reviewed. We will look at what, what has been put forward um, and make sure that, that we have the right path going forward. So Minister, that hasn't happened. And aquaculture has been given an entire division in the department under its own regional director focused entirely on the industry. And while management of wild salmon may be I- implicit, don't you think it's time given the extreme state of wild salmon, many salmon runs that there's better independent oversight and advice the department and Canada's elected officials need someone outside of the bureaucracy and political system to provide overarching unbiased science uh, evidence-based decision making on what is working and what isn't working and what the priorities are do you not agree with that I would say that our science is peer-reviewed Mr. Jones that is one of the the, the reasons why it is you know actually held up by to a very high standard um, with regards to the uh, the independence of the public service, they they don't they they don't do this for political reasons. This is their jobs, um, and they take this science very seriously. And I stand behind them in 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 the extremely important work that they do. 
Further to my previous question around governance, clearly the current system is not working. The department doesn't have a system where they can assess the status of a population, the status of the habitat, set a management target, and then manage for the outcomes you want under an integrated approach using the available management levers, habitat, hatcheries, and harvest. The department has had decades to do this and has never done it. It has been laid out fairly nicely in the wild salmon policy, which was written over 15 years ago, but never fully activated. Cohen said that they should put someone in charge to integrate all things for salmon, but the department has never done that. If you pour $647 million into a system that isn't working and one that has never been active, never activated an effective management framework, I'm worried that we'll lose the opportunity to get better results. This is why a new governance framework is needed and necessary. One that includes the department, the province, First Nations, otherwise we're just going to end up spending more, more money on a system that lacks a management framework, lacks a reporting system, and lacks accountability for results. And we know what's best for salmon needs to be a priority, and what's good for users must come second. Will you speak about a new model? Thank you, Mr. Johns, and I, I would also like to thank you for your, your advocacy. Um, I, I, you and I have had a number of good discussions over the, the last years with regards to this issue, and I, I appreciate your comments. Um, I will also say that you know the new, the new Center for Expertise is going to be something that will bring people together so that we aren't working at cross purposes. And I think that this is one of the challenges that we have seen, um, you know, when, when we've got so many different groups trying to do the same thing, it's really important to, uh, to make sure that, that we do come together in, in, and find the right path forward working in collaboration. And I know that people say, oh, you say that all the time as Mr. Zimmer did, but the, the reality is, is that if we have to do this, with First Nations. We have to do this with the province. We have to do this with environmental groups. And the Center for Expertise is going to be able to give us that 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 ability to work with the, the best people on the ground who are doing this work now. So I, I think that, you know, your point is very well taken. Um, and I would say that that is actually the, the goal that I have is to make sure that we are uh, working with everyone to make sure that we find the best way to conserve and protect these species. We'll now go to Mr. Hardy for six minutes or less, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good to see you, Minister and, uh, and officials. Um, for the longest time, there's certainly been a strong feeling that having the DFO responsible for aquaculture runs in direct conflict to their obligation to employ the precautionary principle because there's been so much evidence that suggests that aquaculture operations have been harmful, especially to some of our salmon runs. Have you made any progress on the long-standing recommendation from the Cohen Commission to get responsibility for aquaculture away from the DFO? First of all, I'd like to, oh, thank you for the question. Um, and I would say, first of all, that I have full confidence in the science that DFO uh, produces. There is a robust process in place when it comes to the peer review process for aquaculture. Uh, all decisions that are made are based on the best available science using the precautionary approach. And the, the aquaculture industry, while undergoing a transition on the West Coast, is extremely important right across the country. Um, and it supports thousands of jobs. So DFO has immense expertise. They make sure that they are, are working in collaboration with, uh, with the industry as well. But I also have begun um, work on things like the Aquaculture Act, which will provide clarity to the industry. We've also been, uh, my parliamentary secretary, Terry Beach, has been doing consultations with regards to the 2025 uh, transition commitment. Uh, you know, we're going to continue to work with industry. We're going to continue to use the science to, to base our decisions on. And we're and and I have full confidence in the department's uh, science science process. What is the state of our assessment of salmon stocks in British Columbia? Do we have up to date assessments of those stocks? Um, I guess what I could say to that is that that salmon are in serious decline. Uh, I think we are seeing some populations as low as 90% down in some areas. Um, we have almost 50 different types of salmon that are on the uh, possible species at risk listing. Uh, so there is no time to waste in terms of trying to make sure that we, uh, we, we, we find the, the right path forward. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure if I could turn to my deputy, he may have more numbers with regards to what the, uh, the salmon stock numbers are. 
And Rebecca, perhaps you can take that one on. Um, so thanks very much. So we have over 9,000 um, individual um, stocks in BC and the Yukon. We don't have stock assessment information for all of them. We do have a very comprehensive uh, collection of uh, stock assessments for the, the main runs. Um, and that information is, is used um, in evaluating fisheries every year. Uh, I've heard from uh, my old friend Alex Morton in the West Coast. She's done a review of the sea lice situation and young salmon going past the farms that are now not operating. And there's a reduction of about 90% in the infestation there. So I, I have to say that uh, on the one hand, we hear, well, you've got to act, you've got to act. And then, well, no, you better wait until you talk to this one, that one, and the other one. We were dealing with an urgent situation here. And you took, I think, very brave and very, you know, immediate action. And it was clearly necessary, given the kind of damage that was being done there. That's my uh, commentary. Now, the question, the uh, Center of Excellence, who's going to, who's it going to report to? The, the new um, uh, Center of Expertise for the salmon is, is yes. your salmon yeah. strategy. That'll be run out of DFO. Um, but it will be done in, in cooperation with uh, the stakeholders on the ground working in this industry. Okay, I have to say that there is, um, you know, suspicion on the coast that sometimes the DFO isn't very forthcoming at passing information along to the minister. Uh, you know, we certainly had inferences uh, in the uh, uh, in, in the salmon study earlier on that uh, certain information had not reached you, that it had been suppressed. Now, that's a claim that was made. Uh, uh, I'm not asking you to uh, confirm or, or not. I'm just putting that on the table. Can I somebody- also, Can I just also mention that there, there was also going to be an arm's length advisory panel with regards to, or an advisory board um, at the center of expertise as well, that will be made up from of individuals out, both inside and outside of DFO. Where are we headed in terms of, uh, you know, perhaps getting a hatchery strategy in place? So with regards to the, um, the salmon strategy, uh, some of the money, of course, is for uh, conservation-based uh, hatcheries. Um, we are actually looking at uh, a number of ways that we know that hatcheries play an important role in the uh, the conservation and protection of wild Pacific salmon. Um, so I think that that with regards to hatcheries, that's going to be part of the bigger picture as we go forward with the salmon strategy. We'll now go to Mr. Arnold for five minutes or less, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank the minister for appearing at the committee today. It's been a long time since you've appeared at this committee. Um, minister, who is ultimately responsible for leading DFO? That would be me. And are all of the fisheries decisions you make based on science? Uh, science would be the primary driver of the decisions that we make, um, but there are other considerations that are taken into account. Okay, thank you. Uh, as much as I know you want us to be excited about the funding announced, the committee has heard repeatedly that the resources need to be paired with the right plans and actions to restore Pacific salmon. The state of Pacific salmon today shows your government's approach over the past five and a half years has failed to the point that the committee has been warned of pending collapses and extinctions. The salmonoid enhancement program is chronically under, underfunded and the strategic salmon health initiative is lapsing because resources have not been provided. Why do you refuse to provide the resources needed for proven and essential work like these initiatives? I would say that we have actually, as a government, done a great deal with regards to uh, salmon enhancement. There is more that needs to be done, and I could not agree with you more that we need to do it in collaboration with the organizations that work on the ground with these uh, really important in these really important areas. Um, we are committed to doing that. That's one of the reasons why you know the salmon strategy that we will be putting forward will be done in collaboration with the provinces, with the or with the province, with the territory. Um, with First Nations, with environment, environmental organizations, with uh, industry, and with anglers. Okay, it's interesting that you say you'll be working with all of these groups, because in 2018, your government worked with the BC government, First Nations, academics, industry, and others in developing a science advisory report that followed the, the emergency assessment of Fraser Steelhead. I have three questions here on this. Are you aware that 
DFO unilaterally diluted the conclusions of the emergency assessment and issued a science advisor report with conclusions that were not scientifically defensible? And what actions have you taken to assure that this assault on intergovernmental cooperation and scientific process is investigated and prevented in the future? And how can Canadians trust you and your de department to be making impartial science-based decisions when your officials discarded the science to protect the status quo rather than protecting the fish on the brink of extinction? Our government has made extremely difficult decisions when it comes to fisheries management. Um, we've also, you know, base our decisions on science. I will stand firmly behind our process with regards to the peer review science that we use to make our decisions. Uh, management decisions are often very, very difficult because of course they impact livelihoods. Uh, that management, will... Those management decisions disregarded the science that was provided, the, the uh, professional science and your department discarded it in order to make another decision. And I would say, sir, that um, because of previous cuts that we have seen from the previous government, uh, DFO science was, was challenged. We have been working very hard to make sure that we are able to invest in science again. Um, we are making sure that we have the right tools in place to make these very difficult decisions. Uh, and I will say that this government is committed to making sure that we take that very seriously and we make sure that those decisions are based on peer-reviewed science within the department. And again, I will say that your department manipulated the science and per, per, provided a report that diluted the, the science that was there. I want to move on. Um, I was speaking about the continuing salmon declines we've seen in my riding, the Adams River, um, and your actions and inactions, how they've hurt British Columbia, the Discovery Islands decision, the spot prawn decision uh, or, or uh, reinterpretation, uh, the public fishers that have been let down without a, an opportunity for mark selective fishery, uh, the failure of your department to uh, address pinnipeds in the, uh, the Salish Sea and the Pacific and the, the Atlantic as far as that goes, and a failure to uh, follow through on the mandate from your prime minister to provide uh, funding for aquatic invasive species in BC uh, to, to prevent aquatic invasive species. Um, how can you make these decisions that you've made without a scientific background that, to, to, to make these decisions on? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, you've made these decisions without providing any reasoning to the, the people that are affected by them. The spot prawn harvesters are still trying to understand why the decision was made. You've, the public fishers haven't seen any answers uh, as to the reasons why. There doesn't seem to be any reason behind any of your answers or any of your decisions. First of all, I, I'm going to say that I'm extremely proud of our government and the decisions that we have made with regards to uh, investments in making sure that we are doing everything we possibly can to protect the wild Pacific salmon. Um, you know, you talked about that. We've also invested in in uh, budget 2018, I believe, $43 million for aquatic invasive species. Is there more to be done? Absolutely. Um, with regards to the BC Shrift program, we have made significant investments uh, in, in habitat restoration. If with there was more to be to done science, on the aquatic, if there was more to be done on the aquatic invasive species, why was there nothing in the massive budget of 2021 for invasive species in BC? We are continuing to make sure that we are, are working with uh, to, to, to deal with aquatic invasive species. Um, of course, there is ongoing funding for uh, things like the, uh, the Asian carp, for things for sea lampreys. Um, and of course, we know that there's been challenges this year with regards to uh, the quagga mussels. Um, we are continuing to work you know, in collaboration with and, and to get science to make sure that we make the right decisions with regards to these species. Um, you know, it, it is a challenging, it is. But there's nothing in budget 21, 2021 for that. Um, I, if I, I need to get another question in here, if I can, um, if you've based these decisions that you say you have, and you're proud of your department, if you've based them on science and, and sound reasoning, why have you not shared those reasons with the people whose lives are most directly impacted? I would say that we actually have, um, absolutely communicated uh, to 
to stakeholder groups, to First Nations on decisions. Uh, you know, the management decisions are often very tough because it does mean that we have to, uh, you know, sometimes cut quota, sometimes cut total allowable catch, depending on where you are. Um, these are these are tough, Mr. Arnold. But There's those no but those reasons haven't been made clear to the stakeholders. As I mentioned, the spot prawn harvesters have no idea why the decision to to reverse the uh, the uh, interpretation. Public fish har or public har fishers haven't received an, an answer satisfactory to their questions. Many of them haven't received a response. Why? And as I have said, with regards to the spot prun specifically, uh, you know, I mean, I am I am 100% committed to getting this issue solved for the long term. Um, we did have we were able to work with the industry to have a, a plan in place for this year, but we will be making sure that there is a plan in place as we go forward. Uh, but that has to be done in consultation with the industry. Thank you, Minister. The Cohen Commission was initiate, initiated in response to severe declines in Pacific salmon stocks, and the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative, or SSHI, was established in 2013, soon after the Cohen report, uh, calling for more information. Since 2013, SSHI work has examined and reported on very important science. Why are you shutting down the SSHI program after having only completed two of the four phases of the investigation? I am actually going to turn to my deputy minister uh, for this one, please. And I think Rebecca, that's uh, in your world as well. Uh, yes, so the, the SSHI had um, was organized through a series of phases. And so we have completed uh, phase two of the program. Phase three, which is uh, requires sort of the establishment of a, a wet lab facility is not funded at this point. And so the work is uh, work underway right now is writing up the papers, doing that type of, of activities um, while funding is sought for that next step. We'll now go to uh, Mr. Calkins for five minutes or less, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for being here today. The Department has been aware of Mark Selective Fisheries proposals now for um, over eight years, and we simply can't get a, a definitive answer one way or the other. So, Minister, I, I, I'd like to think you're in charge of the Department, and I'd like to think that you've seen the, the reasonableness of Mark Selective Fisheries proposals from uh, the advisory boards and virtually just, just about everybody says that it's okay to go ahead with these things. Um, so are you going to instruct your department to proceed with Mark Selective Fisheries uh, so that we can have uh, this uh, effective conservation tool and achieve actually a balance between conservation and socioeconomic objectives? Thank you for the question, Mr. Calkins. I would say that um, I am not, as I have said, and, and as I have said to you before, I'm not adverse to a Mark Select uh, fishery. I do believe it needs to be done in a uh, measured fashion. We cannot have something happening that may impact the wild stocks. Uh, we have opened up Mark Select fisheries in a small scale in some areas as a test, as a pilot program to see what can, uh, what can work. But we have to recognize that due to the potential of, of increased um, fishing effort, increased mortalities from hooking and releasing, that these are all things that have to be taken into consideration and are a real concern. Uh, we also need to make but sure they, that- But those things are, well, with all due respect, I'm an angler. I, I'm a sport fisherman, I'm a recreational I am, fisherman. I'm aware. Um, and I know that there is always going to be some mortality in uh, even in a catch and release fishery, but that doesn't prevent catch and release fisheries from existing. Um, but I also know from being an angler on the West Coast that as soon as you catch your quota or your limit on a particular species, you generally move on, especially if you're chartering somebody to take you fishing. So when you catch your one coho, you move on to the next fish. So by allowing people to actually catch and keep the first mark selected or first marked Chinook salmon that they catch, they're gonna move on to other species. And I don't see how that would be more damaging than actually just having a catch and release uh, fishery that encourages catch and release of Chinook salmon all day long. And with all due respect, I, I just don't know if the department really understands the mind of a recreational fisherman. And I will say that, you know, I mean, I recognize how challenging this has been for the rec fishery, um, not only because of COVID, but because of the management measures we've had to take. Uh, that is one of the reasons why that this 
this investment that we have put in the budget is going to be so significant to um, making sure that we can do everything we have to do to see how we go forward with the Mark Select Fishery. I look forward to working with the, the anglers, the, the sport fishers, to find out what that could look like for them. Um, recognizing, though, also that we do have to be, cons stocks are in serious decline, and we have to be very careful with what we're allowing to happen in areas yeah. where there are challenges to those fish. I think we should be careful. Not all stocks are in, there's, there's certain ones, I'll agree, and everybody at this table would agree that certain stocks are in decline. Certain stocks are also very healthy and very vibrant. Certain stocks are actually just created for the purpose of putting fish into the ocean to be caught uh, through uh, hatchery programs and so on. Um, and I'm an Albertan minister, and um, like uh, many Albertans, we count on going to the West Coast to catch fish. And we know um, that um, ba based on uh, talking to uh, the, those who offer charters and so on, uh, they know that we're not going to pay for airfare. We're not going to drive to the West Coast unless we have some type of certainty and predictability that we can keep one, maybe two Chinook salmon. That is the prized fish that's out there. We know that there are many Chinook salmon that are produced by hatcheries in Washington and other areas. And there's every indication, like last year, that there was great opportunities to catch and retain Chinook salmon. All indications are this year that there's going to be a good return of Chinooks, not in the uh, stocks of concern, but in other areas. Um, so what kind of certainty and predictability? Are we going to have the same kind of summer catch retentions that we had last year? Because the sooner the department or you decide to announce that, the sooner uh, people will book trips uh, to the West Coast and provide some economic certainty uh, to, uh, to uh, those that uh, rely on Chinook salmon fisheries for a livelihood. Can you give us any clarity on what's going to happen um, sooner rather than later? Those, that decision will be coming soon, Mr. Calkins. Um, we are also developing a framework uh, on whether Chinook Mark Select Fisheries and Mass Marking can be applied as a management tool. Uh, DFO is consulting on the Chinook Mark Select Fishery proposals from the rec sector. Um, and and we, have, we are planning to proceed with a, a pilot basis in, in 2021 this year. So there are, there are steps being taken. Um, as I have said many times, I am not adverse to a Mark Select Fishery. It just needs to be done in the right time frame and in the right way. Um, also recognizing that there are stocks of concern that, that we do need to be very careful about. Um, so making sure that we have the right information, making sure that we have the right data, making sure that we you know, are, are, are addressing these concerns that we're hearing from, from people, it's all part of the process. Uh, we'll now go to the committee room to Mr. Zimmer for five minutes or less, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the Minister for attending today. So my questions will be around what my colleague, Mr. Calkins, has already referred to, and that's a selective fishery in BC. Uh, I have to read you a recommendation 30 of the Cohen Commission. It says the Department of Fisheries and Oceans should designate an individual to coordinate scientific, educational, and management efforts in relation to selective fishing practices. Minister, has this been done? Uh, I'm gonna have to turn to my department because I, I will admit that I am not aware of that. Uh, and in turn, I'll turn to our Regional Director General for Pacific, uh, Rebecca Reed. Um, so thanks very much uh, for the question. Um, so we do have a selective fishing policy that we apply um, for salmon. Actually, for um, the person that's been applied, designated individual, I just want to know if that's been done and who is it? Um, so uh, the, the policy is implemented by all fishery managers. I'm, I'm, no, I'm actually asking about the one that says designated individual to coordinate scientific educational management efforts. So who is that person? Um, so well, we have a regional director of science and the regional director of fisheries management who work together on, on those two aspects. So maybe I can get those names just uh, specifically so we know who to, to go to after this. So I'll go back to the minister. Uh, just in speaking about the, the selective fishery in BC, the BC government has been very supportive of a selective fishery in BC. As you know, I have a document that was written to the BC uh, salmon management team. At DFO. So we look forward, this is from the letter, we look forward to further discussion regarding salmon enhancement. We encourage increased uh, Chinook mass marking to enable better management and identification of hatcheries uh, Chinook production. 
This can lead to efficiencies in Chinook production and better management of harvest, which can lead to increased prey availability for the southern resident killer whale and certainly for harvesters. Further, BC, dis, uh, sorry, BC encourages DFO to be flexible in its management approaches to not only conserve and protect stocks of concern, but also facilitate limited uh, and safe harvest opportunities on abundant stocks where uh, locally supportable. We are hopeful that all options, including a mark selective fisheries, uh, are being considered by DFO to ensure conservation and socioeconomic objectives can be achieved. Minister, uh, we have 25 MPs that are asking for a selective fishery in BC. We're having a BC government that's asking for a selective fishery. We're having a public fishery that's acting, uh, asking for a selective fishery. When? Thank you for the question, Mr. Zimmer. And I will say that, uh, as I have said to, to Mr. Calkins, I'm not adverse to a, a mark select fishery. I do believe I, that I heard your answer, Minister, is, but I guess I'm asking for the next part of that uh, answer then is when. Would you like when. me to finish, please? I'm Can asking for when, Minister. When? We, are cur we currently have a pilot program in place. We will continue to work to find the, the best way forward, recognizing that the wild Pacific salmon are in dire straits in some areas. We know. And we need to make sure that anything we do does not impact the conservation well, that, of those fish. That's the great part about a selective fishery, Minister, is that you can selectively fish and catch certain fish and selectively not catch certain fish with fishing methods. And you know, I've done many videos, I'm, I'm sure you've seen some of them that explain what a selective fishery is and how it works. Uh, we're just asking it to be implemented. And you've said that you're doing a test fishery this summer, but test and then what? Is it a test fishery, then there's another five years of a pause, or we can actually move into a selective fishery that can be used uh, uh, BC-wide? What's your end goal, I guess? So 2021 is the test selective fishery. What's the next step? My end goal is to make sure that we have wild Pacific salmon. That is my end goal. We have a stock that is in serious decline. We need to do everything possible. We are making sure that we are doing that. Uh, a mark select fishery, is a possibility, there's no question, but we need to make sure that before anything moves ahead, we do what we have to do in order to conserve the stock that yeah, we have. And, and, and that's the great part about a selective fishery, it allows us to do both. Uh, you use the word collaboration a lot, and that in, by Oxford's definition is the action of working with someone to produce something. Uh, you use it a lot, you use word salads a lot, Minister. Collaboration, uh, public uh, fishery have been more than willing to actually do a demonstration and to show you that it works. But they don't feel collaborated with. All they feel like is that they've used data or you've taken their data and just simply ignored it. You've ignored conversations at tables that they've been at for months. Uh, when are you gonna actually establish a selective fishery that's been, been asked? And I know you're gonna repeat your answer, but my hope is that you'll give us a date and expected, this is my best, uh, Mr. Zimmer, 2021 is the test date, 2022 is maybe when we can see a 50% selective fishery. Uh, maybe in, in three or four years, we can see a 100% selective fishery. Minister, we need answers now. I have met with the Sport Fishing Advisory Board. Mr. And you've Zimmer, ignored their I, advice. Could you, could Hi, I Mr. Zimmer, question? You're, Thank you. Your time is up. Uh, so getting back to the Sport Fishing Advisory Board and the questions I was posing to you before, before I ran out of time, this from the BC government, once again, we also encourage DFO to implement some of the specific fishery proposals that have been put forward that balance conservation with harvest opportunities where possible, including those mark selective fishing opportunities recommended by the Sport Fishing Advisory Board. So I'm gonna read a document uh, from this, the SFAB. Um, this is their, their warning to the ministry uh, and advice. In order to sustain both wild Chinook stocks of concern and the recreational and potentially other fisheries, it is critically important that DFO make the policy decision as soon as possible to implement mass marking of hatchery origin Chinook in BC to enable widespread mark selective fishery management when non-selective management uh, poses too high of risk to stocks of concern. Minister, when are you gonna implement a selective fishery in BC? Thank you, Mr. Zimmer. Uh, as I have said, we have put a pilot program in place with regards to a mark selective fishery. There needs to be a, an absolute uh, more work done when it comes to 
making sure that they are not going to impact the stocks of concern. We are working on that now. We have put in place areas where there can be a mark select fishery. Um, there, so you know, once again, and, and once I've, again, I, Minister, I think you talk about a framework because you've talked about a framework for different things before. But in fairness, you haven't stated a framework for implementing a selective fishery in BC. It's a big thing. It's going to take some work to do. That's what the Department of Fisheries and Oceans should be working on as we speak based on uh, Cohen Commission recommendations and other advice. Uh, let me just another quote from the SFAB. The SFAB cannot overstate the urgency of the situation and the critical need to implement Chinook mass marking mm -hmm. as soon as possible. Uh, the recreational fishery infrastructure simply cannot survive widespread Chinook non-retention from April into July and perhaps longer around much of the inner south coast mm -hmm. on an annual basis. We know from bio, bio sampling, sorry, sa sorry, Minister, bio sampling programs that sufficient numbers of hatchery origin Chinook are present in the Salish Sea during this time. We simply need a way for anglers to identify them in order to sustain both the fishery and in, uh, unenhanced sh uh, Chinook stocks of concern. Minister, we need a better answer than you're just going to do a test uh, this summer. When are you going to implement a full-on uh, selective fishery in BC? We need to have the data on a marked selective fishery. That's why there is a pilot program. Your colleagues have talked about science and we need to, to make decisions based on data. That's what we're doing right now. The decision on a mark selective fishery will happen once we have the proper data that shows it does not impact the stocks of concern. Well, with respect, Minister, what's been already provided to you in, in terms of data is from the SFAB and many others. We have examples in Washington State and Oregon that have already gone through this process and it's functional today. Uh, one more quote from the SFAB. It should be noted that because of the of sufficiently high mark rates, the opportunity exists now to implement a mark selective fishery management for Chinook at certain times. As a generalization, these potential opportunities occur around the south end of Vancouver Island and into the lower strait of Georgia in the winter to late May period, enabled by the presence of significant numbers of U.S. Mm -hmm. and therefore adipose fin clipped hatchery origin Chinook. Minister, you have the data. Why don't you just do it? As I have said, there are stocks of concern that we have to be we have to be aware of. A mark select fishery, conservation always has to be our priority. Right now, a mark select fishery does not allow for for fishing in an area where there are stocks of concern. That's why it's called that the selective fishery, Minister. Is you can selectively I'm not well catch the, the stocks of the concern. I'm aware of why it's called a selective fishery, Mr. Zimmer. Pardon me. I said I'm well aware of why it's called a select a mark select fishery. So I guess with all the data that's been presented to you and by the experts that you call on to give you advice, they've they've even offered that this can be done now. This can be established right now. And yet we hear stalling after stalling after stalling examples from the department about establishing a selective fishery. Even the ability to have uh, machines that that uh, mark fish uh, have been turned down. We've we've understood. So, Minister, you know, it's been given many opportunities for you to, to get to an easy yes answer on this. A lot of evidence, a lot of data, a lot of uh, BC fishing uh, families, frankly, relying upon a good decision based on data, based on science that you, you yourself have, have solicited, and you're just simply not listening to it because you, you want to uh, still prevent that for, from happening from some, uh, for some reason. So, I guess I just need a clear answer. If you're not going to listen to the data provided, well, what is it going to take? Actually, Mr. Zimmer, you've gone way over time, so the time for an answer is well past. Uh, I'll now go to Mr. Hardy for five minutes or less, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, did you want to uh, fill in any uh, final uh, comments on the last line of questioning, uh, Minister Jordan? As I've said many times, Mr. Hardy, the Mark Select Fishery is not something I am opposed to. I think it's actually, a, you know, a good idea. We just need to make sure that I have the right science and data that is backed up, that makes sure there is not a challenge within areas of concern. I will continue to say that. 